Hello, this is Andrew Wolf. I'm continuing my series of videos on oncologic emergencies, and in this video I'm focusing on neutropenic fevers. So neutropenic fevers are the considered the primary cause of mortality in 36% of cancer patients, and a secondary or a component in the mortality of up to 68% of cancer patients. So neutropenic fevers are an important uh, emergency to know about and understand because it um, leads, it is one of, it is probably arguably the most common cause of mortality and morbidity in cancer patients. So neutropenic fevers are sort of completely iatrogenic. They are caused by, they are essentially a side effect of chemotherapy. Now chemotherapy, as most chemotherapies that we use today, are work by attacking rapidly dividing cells because, you know, our cancer cells are rapidly dividing, right? Now, the problem is some of our normal body cells are also rapidly dividing. In particular, the cells in our gut mucosa, a little picture of the colon here, and so we've got our gut mucosa, and then we also have our bone marrow. And the other areas of rapidly dividing cells are the cells in our hair follicles as well. So we've got, and actually, you know, in adults, the bone marrow where the uh, hematopoiesis is occurring is actually in the flat bones. Um, so bear with me here with my rough drawings. Um, so actually, these are mostly, you know, occurring in, in the pelvis and the sternum. Um, and, you know, hematopoiesis um, actually occurs in, in the lung bones, primarily only in children. Um, so we have chemotherapy that is attacking the cells that form the gut mucosa and attacking the cells that are um, in the bone marrow that are engaged in hematopoiesis. And so what does this do? Well, it disrupts the gut mucosa and it disrupts hematopoiesis. So this has two significant effects. Disrupting the gut mucosa allows for translocation of gut flora, right? So, you know, our colon is filled with lots and lots of bacteria, primarily gram-negative bacteria. Um, and actually, you know, we've got our mouth and our nose with mucosa as well that, you know, This area of mucosa is also being broken down, right? So our oropharynx and nasopharynx are always also being broken down. And these areas are filled with lots and lots of gram-positive bacteria. And because of the disruption of the mucosa in these areas, in the colon and in the mouth and uh, oral nasopharynx, we can have translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream, right? So we end up with the possibility of translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream, otherwise known as sepsis, right? And then on this other side, we've got disrupted hematopoiesis. So hematopoiesis is the process by which um, hematopoietic stem cells um, grow into mature erythro erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, and white blood cells and, pla and platelets, right? So we end up with a pancytopenia. 
so we end up with anemia, neutropenia, or low white blood cell count, and thrombocytopenia, right? And what we're concerned about most here is the neutropenia. Now, so neutrophils are white blood cells that are considered granulocytes because they are filled with little granules. And they're very aggressive phagocytes, so they sort of gobble up bacteria, and um, they are mobile in the bloodstream. So they are actually generally the most common white blood cells in the, in the bloodstream. They make up about 70% of all white blood cells in the plasma at any given time. And they are, you know, very active phagoc phagocytes of bacteria. And they are very important because of their phagocytic role as well as their role in, you know, their granule, the granules that make them granulocytes are filled with cytokines. And these cytokines help to direct the inflammatory response against bacterial infections. So neutrophils play a central role in fighting off bacterial infections. So now we have a situation in which we have um, disrupted mucosal membranes in both the gut and the oral and nasopharynx that allows us to have translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream and then we have a deficit of neutrophils which are the chief you know main fighters of bacterial infections in the bloodstream that um, so we are set up for a very severe infection that the body cannot fight and this is what happens with neutropenic fevers so we have you know, bacterial infection, or bacterial translocation, plus, you know, immunosuppression, particularly in the arm of the immune system that is most important in fighting bacterial infections, and that equals high likelihood of severe sepsis. So, What's also interesting to note is, you know, because we have patients that have, you know, pancytopenia, you know, you'll notice with cancer patients that are actively receiving chemotherapy, they will have white blood cell counts of, you know, sometimes as low as less than 0 0.1. So it may be down to zero, it may be 0 0.2, um, very, very low, you know, and they are anemic, you know, have crits of 22, or they might might get even lower, you may need to transfuse them, um, and they'll have thrombocytopenia. They might have platelets in, in the 40s or 30s or even lower. Sometimes they'll need transfusions of platelets as well. Now with patients that have a normal immune system and normal white blood cell count, one of the early signs of infection may be that you see, you know, a white blood cell count go from a normal, you know, level of 8.0 one day, and then you're checking labs the next day and it's up to 14.7. But obviously, with a patient that has a white blood cell count that is, uh, that is non-existent, you're not going to be able to see this early sign. So fever is generally the only sign, the earliest and possibly the only sign that you'll receive with a patient with neutropenic fevers. So what's the treatment? The treatment is antibiotics. Empiric antibiotics that are started within one hour. A little clock there. So antibiotics within 60 minutes. And you know, you need a typical broad spectrum antibiotic that covers gram negative flora and gram positive flora. Um, cefepime or zosin are the two choices that we generally use in my facilities. Um, and again, they need to be started started very quickly. After um, 
you know, cultures will also be sent, and these broad spectrum antibiotics can be can be narrowed. However, a uh, bacterial organism is not identified in over 60% of the time patients with neutropenic fevers, so you just need to continue empiric um, empiric antibiotic therapy. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but um, you know, there are three types of infections that can cause neutropenic fevers. Um, bacteria are by far the most common, and in particular, um, gram-negative uh, from gut uh, translocation from the gut, um, and gram-positives um, from translocation from the uh, oropharynx and, um, and nasopharynx. Sometimes there, uh, there can be uh, line sepsis as well. That is also a possibility. Now, if someone has, um, you know, a profound neutropenia uh, for a prolonged period of time, they do become susceptible to fungal infections, so um, fung fungus and, and yeast, so candidemia um, and uh, infections from aspergillus. Um, and again, you know, sort of the higher risk patients with uh, prolonged neutropenia, um, patients can um, become at risk for viral infections as well. And, you know, but again, you need to presume that it is bacterial first because these are, tend to be the most common by far. So generally what we will do is treat them for, um, empirically for bacterial infections and then um, send off cultures. And if the patient continues to be febrile, um, then we start to look for other possibilities like fungal infections and viral infections. Viral infections um, can include things like the uh, herpes simplex viruses, uh, varicella, and uh, cytomegalovirus. Okay, so that's my very brief introduction to uh, neutropenic fevers, and I will see you in my next video.